Shabbat Shalom, Ms. Bakai. This is Maury Medad Yahoo Ben Yashrael. I want to welcome you to another live stream of My Living Branch. Please, as you're jumping on the stream, if you can hear me okay, if you could just leave me a little comment, sound good or Hear you good. Just want to make sure everything is working properly. And once again, we say Shabbat Shalom. To all of our mispakah. So we're going to venture down a much different road. Kind of look at feast days from a different perspective. And that perspective is going to be the challenges that we saw Israel had. When it came to feast days. And some of the things that we have to avoid and how to handle them during the season. Because it's definitely a challenge. And I don't know about you, but my objective is to make these feast days joyous, to make them his feast days, Yahuwah's feast days once again, and that it not be about me or about my thoughts, my ambitions, or how I think it should be done, but they're called Yahuwah's feast days. So if that be the case, then we should be focusing on what he's looking for. And the examples that he left us to bring us to a greater understanding. Because remember, when we're reading, these things are for our learning. So that we can grow and be better. All right, appreciate it. So I guess the, this investment in the mic paid off. So if you want good sound... You have to pay for good sound. And it also helps to have a good voice. All right, let's pray and then we're going to get into this lesson. And I'm praying that your ears are tuned, your spirit is ready so that you can be receptive to the word of Elohim, which is able to save your soul. As we pray, Baruch Hashem Yahuwah, Elohim Malach HaAlam. Father, we say, Toda Rabbah, we thank you for all of our listeners. We thank you for the kindness and compassion that you've shown us. Even though we are undeserving of any such things that you've given us. But because of who you are, You chose us and you set us apart. So we're asking you, Father, to continually be with us, continually stir our fire, continually help us to gravitate towards what is righteous in your sight. And let not self-righteousness grip us as a vice, but let us wear the cloak of righteousness that comes from you. Now I pray, Father, that you would continue to sound the alarm and those that hear and are in tune, that they will act accordingly and they will ready themselves. We say, Toda Rabbah, for all of your goodness. In the name of Messiah Yahusha. Hallel to Yahuwah. Amen. So, what we have today, 
we're going to talk about bitterness. And we're going to walk this thing out. And I'm sure y'all heard that song, walk, 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 walk. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to walk this thing out. Because you have to see that because it's harvest season, that there are other things, other fruit besides righteous fruit that will try to grow in you and produce a crop. And a lot of times these things have been dormant. They were, in, they were down in Mitzrayim or Egypt for an extended period of time. And over time, there was a process that caused them to cry out for deliverance. But that same voice that cried out can also turn to bitterness. And one of the things we have to do is not let our past turn to a crop of bitterness. But we have to see how he laid it out and what calms the bitter spirit. What will cause that bitterness to take a whole different meaning. So let's look at this. Oh, yeah, I, I, I feel all right today. Hope you're feeling good, too. If, if you're feeling good in the comments, let somebody else know, hey, I'm, I'm feeling all right today. I feel good. I feel the Father is going to share something with me that's going to help me, that's going to move me to a different place, that's going to help me see things from a different perspective. So let's look here. Bitterness. And I want to take you here first because this is actually incorporated in Pesach. Okay, look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 6. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Talking about the lamb. Then all the assembly of the congregation of Israel shall slay it between the evenings. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house where they eat it. And they shall eat it. They shall eat the flesh on that night, roast it with fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Very interesting how he incorporates bitter herbs into this feast. Now, the Hebrew word there, aurora, which is a bitter herb, uh, some translations will say a bitter lettuce. So you have a, a huge variety. Some people use parsley. Some use coriander, um, cr um, crescent. Uh, there, I mean, there's a, a whole host of herb type um, plants that are bitter. What I want you to notice, we're just looking at some of the pictographic, we, we're going to think of it pictographic, mem, chaos, resh, resh. So this chaos can have a double impact on the head. So this impact 
because it's used here, it should transform something that you experience in one mindset. It should transform it to a different mindset in your head. So it's all about how you perceive it, how you think about it, how you let it take root in your life. Some people use experiences and it creates negativity. While other people use experiences and it creates, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about bad experiences and it creates positivity. And notice what it's eaten with. All of this is under the setting. Remember the doorpost. There's blood there. The blood of the lamb. Then you're eating the lamb. Then there's a bread that you're eating that's unleavened. That doesn't, doesn't rise. That gives you substance to travel. This distance that you have to go. And the bitter herb is a reminder of where you came from. And what you've experienced. But it's not supposed to affect your mind negative, negatively. But it's supposed to affect your mind in a positive way. That's why he incorporated it. It's supposed to have double impact. On your mind. So let's look at the. The root word. This is the root word. Where Maroa came from. Which is Marar. I want now I want you to notice that. To trickle. To be bitter. And there is a certain place on the tongue that tastes bitterness, just like it tastes sweetness, sour. So I want you to observe what was the process that brought bitterness to Israel? That's the question you have to ask. Remember, if you enslave the mind by whatever means, you enslave the person. Bitterness is a harsh seed. It's a harsh seed. That's why you have to have the right mind to not let bitterness overtake you. And we're going to walk this whole process out because, uh, and, and I'm slow rolling because some things that are entrenched in us, we might not think of it as bitterness, but we're not holding on to the, that thing from the past with the right attitude, with the right mindset. And because we're not doing it from the right place, then it has a tendency to trickle, to turn to bitterness over time. Remember, it's a seed. Now, I kind of labeled these steps. These, these, these were my thoughts as I was thinking this out. Okay. When did this happen? It really happened in darkness because remember when Joseph was there, he was acting as a light. They, uh, the Egyptians knew him. He was regarded highly. But over the process of time, things changed. So let's look at Exodus chapter one, verse eight. Now, there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Yosef. So the king was in darkness. 
Okay, and look what what he observed, his idea, what he sprouted, what he conceived. Exodus chapter one, verse nine. And he said to his people, behold, the children of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come. Let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply and if war break out. They join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Look at the action. Look at the growth. You have a sprout. Now now it's growing into a, a vine, a plant. In the 11th verse, therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They, they built for Pharaoh store cities. Python and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they were trying, the, the more they did things to oppress them and to stunt them, the more Israel grew. Okay, now this is the part. Exodus chapter 1, verse 13. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves. And all kinds of work in the field. Oh, excuse me, I skipped the verse, verse 14. And made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick, and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. So this is where that bitterness starts. And sometimes you can't see it by what you suffer and what you go through. initially but for a lot of us we make decisions and we plot our direction based on things of our past the bitterness that we experience and felt from others now I'm gonna mention it here but do you remember how the father always talked about you were strangers in the land of Mitzrayim? You remember how they treated you. Now, what was his instruction for how we treat strangers? He told us because we were strangers that we're not to treat strangers that way. Hmm. So you were treated one way and it was supposed to, it, it, it would instill would in you to treat somebody else the same way you were treated. But no, the father said, that's not how it's working. You were in that position. So now when you encounter a stranger, you don't do the same thing. You follow my instructions and you treat them according to my kindness. Total opposite. Now, this is just, you know, a few things. Um, probably one of the um, things we want to take from here is that um, just this paragraph right here. And you can read the rest if you want to. Um it's interesting to note that the Hebrew expressed tragic, unpleasant experience in terms of sense of taste, the bitter. Actually, we employed the same figure of speech in our English language. It was galling experience. His actions were not in a good, a very good taste. So what you have what you have to see here is 
bitter has its place. You're going to experience it. But how you process it through your life is the task. And this is what we have. This is, you, you've got to have, if, if you're going to process bitters, bitterness, you have to have, you need a good understanding of the lamb, Mashiach, what he suffered. You need a, a good understanding of the word, the unleavened bread. Because you got to understand the unleavened bread before you understand the leavened bread. So you need the unleavened bread. And then that takes you to the proper leavened bread. Okay, the proper doctrine. But what happens, you know, we, we skip this part. We don't get the unleavened bread. The bread that doesn't rise, the bread that has that purpose to bring us up out of our hardships and is mixed. You're eating it with the bitter herb. So it, it acts as a buffer, a calming effect. You know, so it, it gives you. Uh, along with the bitter herb and the lamb, the strength to come out of what was a harsh environment with the right mindset. And this is all done, shut up in a house with blood on the doorposts. Mm, I hope it's hitting home because sometimes we're trying to handle things but we, we've got to go back to the basics of handling it. Because sometimes we, we use the scripture from a inflamed position. Because we want someone to feel what we felt. We want somebody to experience the harshness that we felt. And the harshness that we're feeling that's still in us. But he gave you a formula how to come out that exodus of that captivity, that bondage. And I could have taken this a little further. That once they came out, what does it, what does it tell us? That all were baptized or immersed unto Moses. They were, they were immersed under the cloud and they were immersed under the water. Clean slate. So when, when you get to where you're going, you, you should have a clean slate. But what happens, a lot of people don't properly clear the slate. They deal with the external stuff. Then the other stuff they bury deep down on the inside. Then years later, it pops up. And they're wondering what's going on. Well, you never really dealt with it. You buried it instead of dealing with it. So let's look. What did they do? They... They came out of Egypt, Mitraim. They went through the Reed Sea. They experienced the, the um, cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. They get to Exodus. Uh, excuse me. When we get to Exodus 15, you, you start reading, they, they sung these songs and they're celebrating victory. But I want you to notice right when that discourse ends, what happens. Look at Exodus 15, 22, because these things 
come to try to see what's in you. And if you're not careful, you'll start producing a different type of harvest that's not supposed to grow. Okay, look at it. And Moshe brought Israel from the uh, Sea of Reeds, and they went out into the wilderness of Shar, or Shur. And they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. And they came to Marah, and they were unable to drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. So the name of it was called Marah. Now notice what the people did. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we to drink? Then he cried out to Yahuwah, and Yahuwah showed him a tree. And when he threw it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Hmm. Here we have again solutions. When you come up against bitterness, but see, bitterness had, had started to, they, they sung all these praises. Then after three days going into the wilderness and there was lack of things didn't, um, that affected them drinking and they were thirsty what happened? They started to grumble against the leader that the father put in place. What, what we're going to drink. They, and they couldn't drink this water. So the leader cried out to the father or, and asked him, what do I do? Hey, and he told him, okay. He showed him a tree. They put that tree in the water, water turned sweet. Now, notice what he says after the waters turned sweet. There he made a law and a right ruling for them. And there he tried them. See, this is what you're not getting. Things are bitter to try you. Are you going to take the appropriate steps to make it sweet? Are you going to put that tree the tree of life in the water and make it sweet? Or are you going to put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Your understanding. How you feel your emotions, your laziness. What are you going to do? Notice what he said. And he said, if you diligently obey the voice of Yahuwah, your Elohim, and do what is right in his eyes, and shall listen to his commands, and shall guard all his laws, I shall bring on you none of the diseases I brought on the Mitzrites. For I am Yahuwah who heals you. And they came to Elam, where there were 12 fountains of water and 70 palm trees. And they encamped there by the water. Now, is this the end of the bitterness? He gave them. Here's another solution. Notice, notice how bitterness was incorporated in Mitraim, Egypt. Now, when they come out of Egypt, they encounter bitterness again. All this stuff is by, not by chance. 
is to heal you if you obey. Not partially. You got you to gotta be obedient fully. If the bitterness is not properly handled in your life, it will produce a fruit called grumbling. First came no water, then came bitter water. What, what are, what's the grumbling? Because that's what we're looking at. Grumbling is loon. To stay permanently. Hence, in a bad sense. So in other words, there was not a willingness to change. To be abstinent. Okay, you might, what is, what is abstinence? Stubbornly adhering to an opinion, purpose, or course in spite of reason, argument, or persuasion. Isn't that what Moses did right here? He was trying to tell them what the father will do. Now, if he can, if he can turn the bitter water sweet, he can heal you. All you got to do is be obedient. But you haven't experienced the fullness of him because you haven't experienced the fullness of being obedient. You want to be obedient your way, not his way. This is really going to come into play, especially in words and complaints. Now, some people don't complain with words. Some people complain with their actions. You know, what you, you can tell by what they do or what they don't do. You know, they're, they're speaking very clearly, even though they're not expressing it in words. It's powerful stuff. Powerful. So, Loon, look at it. Uh, Let's break down the grumbling because the grumbling is, is the seed of, of letting bitterness take root. It's a lament, a wa, or va, and a noon. Teaching seed. And then you have the state. So you could say, it, it combines, it, it binds to you, it connects to you. But it's not a, a good teaching. It's not a proper way. It's not his way. Because he doesn't teach us to complain. He, he actually discourages us from having our own opinions. He told us to lean not to our own understanding. You know, we're, we're supposed to follow him. Everything goes and filters through Torah. Let's keep going. Grumbling only grows. That was, we're in the 15th chapter. Well, guess what? Let's go to the 16th chapter. Man, this thing elevates. It, once, you, once you start down this path with this seed of bitterness, oh my, it, it's, it's, it continues to grow. It grows, it can grow in words, or it can grow in actions. Okay, look at the second verse. And all the congregation of children of Israel grumbled against Moshe, Moshe and Aharon in the wilderness. Okay, they grumbled against his leaders. And the children of Israel said to them, if only. Now, now listen to what this, this seed is doing in them. This spirit. How, how, is, how is multiplying itself in this short period of time? If only we had died by the hand of Yahuwah. So he, now they want Yahuwah to kill him in the land of Mitzrayim. Does that, does that make sense? That totally contradicts why he came to Mitzrayim. The, the mindset is, is all messed up. The thinking 
it's all messed up. But they, they, they're saying, if only we had died by the hand of Yahuwah in Mitzrayim. When we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to satisfaction, for you have brought us. Now, who brought them? Did Moshe bring them or did Yahuwah bring them? Hmm. Go back to the 15th chapter. They sing in his praises. But look what's happening now. Okay. For you have brought us into the this wilderness to put us put all this assembly to death with hunger. And Yahuwah said to Moshe, See, I am raining down bread from the heavens for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion. Every day in order to try them. Now listen. See every every stage is the test. A test of obedience. Everything you're going through. Is a test of obedience. Somebody get on your nerves. Is a test of obedience. You're having trouble on the job. Is a test of obedience. You're having conflict in your home. It could be hey, a test of obedience. What are you going to do? Are you going to take things into your own hands? Or are you going to implement his word? Okay, now let's keep going. In order to try them, whether they walk in my Torah or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in. And it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moshe and, Moshe and Aharon said to all the people, the children of Israel, at evening, you shall know that Yahuwah has brought you out of the land of Mitraim. Okay, so they re-emphasizing, we didn't bring you out, he brought you out. And in the morning, you shall see the esteem of Yahuwah. For he hears your grumbling against him. Now, you got to ask yourself. And I'm wondering, do you consider when you're grumbling about a situation? And if that situation came to try you to see if you'd be obedient. Who are you really grumbling against? Hmm. Let me think on that. Who are you really grumbling against? If the situation is there to try you to see whether you're going to be obedient. Interesting. And what are we that you grumble against us. And Moshe said. In that Yahuwah gave, gives you. Meat to eat in the evening. And in the morning bread to satisfy. For Yahuwah hears your grumbling. Which you made against him. What are we? Your grumblings are not against us. But against Yahuwah. Guess what? It doesn't stop there. It keeps growing. Oh my goodness. Isn't there something else? And see, a lot of this stuff, you know, having been a leader, you know, for many years, you know, when things are going on, a lot of this stuff is, is hidden because people have um, taken their grumblings in hiding. <laughs> you know, they don't they won't do it openly anymore, but they still grumble. But they grumble, um, you know, around others. And often around 
people that they think they can grumble around. But if you start correcting the grumbling, they won't grumble around you anymore. But they say, oh, man, they might tell on me. So I better find somebody else that are just listening, listen to my grumbles. OK, let's go to the 17th chapter. And all the congregation of Israel set out on their journey from the from the wilderness of Sin, according to the mouth of Yahuwah, and encamped at Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people strove with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moshe said to them, why do you strive with me? Why do you try Yahuwah? And the people thirst, thirsted for, there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Mitzrayim to kill us? And our children and our livestock with thirst. Notice when you when you have people that go through situations and they make the situations, it's always about them. That's a that's a warning flag. That's a that's a grumbling warning flag. Everything's always about them. And their situation. That's one of the signs of grumbling. I'm going to leave you with some good nuggets today. Then Moshe cried out to Yahuwah and said, What am I to do with this people? Yet a little and they shall stone me. And Yahuwah said to Moshe, Pass over before the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel Take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. See, I am standing before you there on the rock of Horeb. And you shall strike the rock and water shall come out of it and the people shall drink. And Moshe, Moshe did so before the eyes of the elders of Israel. So I'm telling you, this this grumbling thing, you know, it's 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 serious business. Okay, then I want you to notice. I'm taking and, and we we're winding this thing up. Cause I mean I could go for ever on this, but I just want to get you to the point that you're seeing this. You know, cause what it leads to grumbling only grows to rebellion. Look at Numbers 14, 1. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And the children of Israel grumbled against Moses and against Aaron. And all the congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Mitzrayim, or if only we had died in this wilderness. <laughs> so now it was Mitzrayim, now it's wilderness. Why is Yahuwah bringing us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should become prey? So notice now they've expanded it from just talking about them. They've pulled in other factors, our wives and our children. But the, the core of it is they're talking about themselves. They're still pointing back. It's all about me. Would it be better for us to turn back to Mitzrayim? And they said to each other, let us appoint a leader and let us turn back to Mitzrayim. Then Moshe and Aharon fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Yahusha, the son of Nun, Caleb, the son of Nephoniah, Nah, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their garments, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy is out, is exceedingly good, good land. Okay, look, this, this is ter this, it's just terrible. 
and this this story right here, I'm not even gonna go into it because most of you are familiar with it. Uh, in number sixteen, it involves Korah. Um, he was a son of Lewi, and he was also a firstborn. So he got to the point that he wanted priesthood. So you can go and read that when you want to. So not only did he grumble against Moshe, he caused others to do it too. And trust me, uh, if you look at the 11th verse, therefore, if you and all the company are set against Yahuwah and Aharon, what is he that you grumble against him? So, I mean, this grumbling, I'm telling you, it, no matter what level your uh, the grumbling is, it needs to be dealt with because it is a harsh seed. Whether it's at the seed stage, whether it's sprouted, if if you even sense that this is affecting you, it's time to address it because all of these all of these things are happening during the harvest season. We're supposed to be bringing forth good fruit. But look at this harvest that's coming up. It's, this is like the wheat and the tear. It's not good for anything. It's, it's, it's going to only bring destruction. So it brings us to rebellion. And rebellion... And bitterness, remember bitterness has mem resh resh. Rebellion is mem resh dalit. And I pulled this right here. I thought I thought it was a just a good illustration from the Hebrew word picture. And now that chaos has a door in your mind. So it's a it's a it's a door of bitterness, rebellion. And you don't want to go there. It's when you fight against everything he's trying to do in your life. Look. Take a deep breath. Step back. Reassess your situation. Being tried does not mean he's trying to destroy you. Being tried means he's trying to grow you. To grow you into something that's usable. Something that will produce more good fruit. But if you're constantly fighting against what he's trying to do in your life, how can you grow? How can you mature? When everything, there's a wall of resistance, you know, instead of evaluating, okay, what is, what is he trying to do? You know, we throw the devil, oh, look what the devil did to me. I, I'll be honest, I got rid of that card a long time ago. Because no matter the situation, Father allows things to come to make me better, to strengthen me, to settle me. And if I'm constantly blaming on something else, blaming on hunger, blaming it on thirst, I'm thirsty so I, I, I can talk like this, I'm hungry so I can be abusive like this. No, those are the times that you need to 
bring it under control and say, okay, yes, I'm hungry, but man should not live by bread alone, by, by every word that proceeded by the mouth of Elohim. Yes, I'm thirsty, but he said, if I believe on him as the scriptures have said, out of my belly shall flow rivers of living water. There's a different aspect than just the physical, than what you're physically going through. He's trying to take you to the next level. And my question is, do you want to go there? Are you going to continue to resist? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Well, I, I pray that you reevaluate. Don't go down the road of bitterness, grumbling, rebellion. Take a different path. Submit to his will. Hear him clearly. And if you can't hear him clearly, then you know, uh, if 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 you're in the right place, you know, ask him, hey, Father, send send somebody my way to, to help me with this. But what often happens, people don't want to see receive instruction. People think they know, know it all. And you know, like like I've said, I've when you've been doing this for years, you, you run across everything. You know, sometimes people respect you as a leader. Some pe times people don't. Sometimes you, you know, when they don't, you have to let the father show them. This is, this is my child. He's the one I appointed. Okay. Same thing for your situations. When the situations come and try you. You know, take a deep breath, like I said before. Step back. Collect yourself. See his hand in the situation. See his hand. Listen for his voice. Hear his direction. Because for, for me... The, the next the next level is going to be very interesting and very challenging but very rewarding and you've got to be willing to put in the time sometimes we put in the time for the wrong things it's like saying you want to be married. But you haven't put any into any time preparing to be married. But you think you're Elohim's gift. <laughs> but you not even ready. You, I mean, you want him to sin, you know, what it doesn't matter whether you're man or woman. You want him to send me that person, Father. Oh, then, you know, you want him to sin. And, but here it is. You're not even ready. But let you tell the story. You're more than ready. But I'm here to be the showstopper today. You're not ready. If you're a man, you... Can you provide? Do you know how to function as a man? You know, if you can't make decisions for yourself, how can you make decisions for others? If you're, if you're a woman, you, you're ready, but you lazy. You don't like to cook. 
You can't clean. Oh, there's more than, to it than that. Well, hold on now. Let's, let's go back to scripture. You know, no hospitality. Everything's about you. That's not what scripture says. What did, what did the father say? And your desire should be towards your east. He shall govern or rule over you. So you don't even know how to operate in that capacity. And men, they don't even know how to govern or rule properly. So, I mean, it's, it's something else. We got a lot of preparing to do, spiritually and physically. If we're going to get to the point that we're usable, you, I mean, usable like he wants us to be usable, not like we think we should be used. All right, well, I'm going to leave it there. And we're going to come back with some more of this juicy stuff. I know y'all love the juicy stuff. It's all about these feast days. His order, his purpose. So we, we'll be coming up. Won't be long. The Feast of Weeks will be here. Shavuot. So let's get our hearts and minds ready. All right, let's pray. Let me, let me just take a quick glance at the comments here. See what we got going on. I saw, I see one, I feel good. Dun, 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 dun. See, uh, praise y'all for Mori Yesharon and Mori Kanan being in the stream today. Appreciate you, all the Servants, uh, Shireen, appreciate you for being here. Man, we got we got a ways to go. I tell you, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited for what the Father's going to do. Um, and just before we pray, you know, I'm just just putting it out there. Because usually they start warning us ahead of time. You've, you've been hearing about famine. Or food shortages. And if you watch the news, they're not just food shortages. These are engineered food shortages. You know, how do you have all these fires and planes crashing in the food facilities all doing a short span of time, okay? Just want you to think about it. Everything's being engineered. You know, remember at one time, you could borrow money. They were just throwing money out the plane, you know, if you want to borrow to get a house, but guess what? Interest rates are going up. The climate is changing. The new financial system it's on the horizon. And, you know, some say they'll run side by side. Not maybe, maybe not. But if, but if things go down, um, Berkshire Hathaway, I think they had a conference the other day. And guess what they're doing? They're stockpiling cash right now. Just in case system go down. Hmm. I thought that was interesting that they would m mention that in, in their conference. So just, Hey, just use wisdom. You know, he, he told us that we've got to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So sometimes you gotta, when you don't see it, you gotta feel the vibration of what's going on. And what they're getting ready to do. So I just uh, encourage you to, uh, to, to stay vigilant. And stay, keep your heart and mind prepared. 
Father, I thank you for all of our mispakah. I thank you for how you've shown us so much compassion, so much love. We are deserving. And I pray that this lesson, Father, would serve as a launch pad for renewal for those that hear it. Mm. Somebody needs that renewal today. They've been putting it off, but they see clearly that you were speaking to their heart. Father, I pray that you keep their heart tender and that you would cause them to move in fear of you, not because I'm a great teacher, but because they heard you in the message that they would move and start to get that house the way it should be preparing. Father, I thank you for their renewal. I thank you, Father, for the hope that you've instilled in them today, that their situation is not hopeless, but you bring hope to darkness because there's nothing too hard for you. And I give you praise today, Father, because only you can bring forth something meaningful that people will be able to use and, and live by and help them to navigate. I give you praise for that. All esteem to you, Hop Yahuwah. Now, keep us, Father. Keep us at the foot of your throne. Keep our hearts and minds humble. And I thank you for all the testimonies whether they're seen or unseen, they shall go forth. Thank you, Father. In the name of Mashiach Yahusha, Hallel to Yahuwah, Amin. Alrighty, so we still have our bookmarker witnessing uh, team, our program. Um, those who, that's what the bookmarkers would look like. So if you want to um, get some bookmarkers, just go to bm.hebrewfoundation.org. Okay, we, we, we'll start saying it now. Passover, be here before you know it. <laughs> so, hey, if you would like to just have tools for your children to be able to instill in them the values of scripture. The Hebrew Passover story is available in paper edition and Kindle. So check it out. Just go to Amazon, type it in the search engine. It'll come right up. Okay, if you haven't, hey, go over and join our website. We'd be glad to have you. We post uh, different videos and other things over there that are Keep you abreast to world events and what's going on, and you can interact with others that are in um, that you know follow us on live stream and on YouTube. Be able to interact, so it's a good good place to be. And if you would like to support us, you can through online donations, or you can go to PayPal or Cash App. But most of all, we solicit your prayer requests so that we can continue to do the will of Elohim and serve him because that's our mission. All right, Ms. Baka, um, we say Shabbat Shalom to all. We appreciate you for stopping by and considering our live stream. You're what makes the live stream live. So we appreciate you. If you have any questions, concerns, you can reach out to me at info at mylivingbranch.org or you can hit me up on the website.
Some people just prefer to go to the website and hit me up. So really appreciate that. And we're forever indebted for to you for supporting us in prayer. So we appreciate you and look forward to hearing from you. You know, if you're just dropping a line just to say shalom. All right, this is Maureen Medad Yahoo saying unto you, Shabbat Shalom, and let's make this the best Shabbat ever. Shabbat Shalom, Ms. Bakah.